world leading expert in modeling potential habitable worlds. So basically, how do we know we can see life somewhere else without going there? How do we do that? Which is wonderful. And she is a science team member in NASA's test mission and in the nearest instrument at uh, the J James Weber Space Telescope. She has been named one of America's young innovators by the Smithsonian Magazine, an innovator to watch by Time Magazine, and was selected as one of the European Commission's role models for women in science and research. And she has had many, many uh, international awards. Let's see, I can mention some of them. Uh, the invited discourse lecture at the International Astronomical Union General Assembly in Hawaii, the Heinz Meyer Leibniz Prize for Physics of Germany, the Doppler Prize for Innovation of Science in Austria. She is from Austria. Uh, uh, and also, let's see, uh, and the Barry Jones Inauguration Award of the Royal Astro Astrobiology Society and Open University in Britain. She has had several reviews. One of them I highly recommend if you're interested in looking for life in other worlds, look for her review titled How to Characterize Habitable Worlds and Signs of Life. And she's kind of like a star too. She's part of an IMAX 3D movie, The Search for Life in Space. She has given many public lectures at the Aspen Ideas Festival, for TED Youth, at the World Science Festival, and the Kavli Foundation Lecture at the Idle Planetarium. And she has the first book that was published in German and Italian, and she just told me, so fresh news, that she has a book that she's working on now in English. So it will be coming out here in the United States, obviously on the subject of is there life out there? And the title of our talk is How to Find Life on Exoplanets, Challenges and Ideas. Lisa, welcome. Thank you so much, Marcello, for the super warm and nice welcome and for the invitation. And I'm so looking forward, we're gonna be able to meet in 3D again and actually uh, talk and have the coffee or the tea in person. So thank you everyone for coming and for uh, surviving another Zoom meeting. I promise I'll try to make it interesting. And um, what I wanted to talk to you about today is this idea, if there are other planets like ours out there, how could we tell if they would have similar conditions as Earth? So I said challenges and ideas because it's really hard work trying to figure out if there could be life out there. However, for the first time, we have the telescopes coming online, the James Webb Space Telescope this year, starting in Halloween, well, launching at Halloween, hopefully. And then in 2025, the extremely large telescope in Chile, those should be the first telescopes that allow us to collect enough light to look into the atmosphere of small rocky planets that are not incredibly hot, but in the so-called temperate habitable zone. And I'll walk you through those ideas and I'll tell you how we're trying to do that and what we've found so far. So let me first introduce um, the Carl Sagan Institute at Cornell and I hope a lot of you will come by and visit us. So currently we are about 35 faculty and senior researchers from 15 different departments. I started the Institute in 2005 when I got to Cornell and the idea is really to develop the toolkit to find life in the universe in our solar system and outside. So I'm more and the talk you'll have today is more on the outside so around other stars but we have a vibrant community of people from, as I said, 15 different departments, biology, chemistry, astro, earth and atmospheric science, engineering, many different things, music, science communication, performing arts. So uh, it's usually a vibrant discussion. We have a monthly coffee. Uh, so if you happen to be around Ithaca and Cornell, let us know. Uh, it's usually always fun to join the coffee. And of course, we have very good coffee, and tea and usually cookies and chocolate and also healthy fruit snacks. So as you all know, that's one of the best things to get good ideas flowing. But so there's a wide variety of people interested in Cornell to do that. And so I will show you my part 
what I want to do or what my research really focuses on. But the interesting thing that we have managed to do, as you also do in endorsements to, uh, to this degree, is trying to actually have students between different departments, between two supervisors and so on and so forth. So if you're considering a place for your PhD or for your postdoc or have somebody who might, and this is something that they're interested in, please send them our way. We're always looking for good people. So as Marcello was incredibly kind, a lot of the information that I'm going to tell you and more, because I only have 45 minutes, is in the review that I wrote, How to Characterize Habitable Worlds and Science of Life. And note, it's only my name on the review because I didn't want to get anybody else into trouble. There's some opinion in it. However, I was trying to actually show the whole state of the field and give you my educated opinion of what I think is our best way forward. And so there's, of course, a challenge. And the first challenge in all of this is, how do you identify a habitable world? So let me start with what we learned so far. As you probably know, the most important techniques currently to find exoplanets are either the radial velocity technique, where you see the star move because the planet tugs on it, or the transit technique, where you basically have, because by chance, we look at the star the right way, the planet block part of the hot stellar surface from our view, partially dimming this temporarily. So the Earth would do that once a year for the sun. And it's a tiny, tiny percentage that's so super hard to find. But what I'm showing you here is, uh, is the figure for the radius of the detected exoplanets here in the y-axis and the period in days. And now the color coding in this figure is by host star's effective temperature. So what you see in this is that most of the planets, especially the ones that were found initially, were actually big planets, hot Jupiters, because they're close to the star. So here we only at a one, two, three day orbit. So these were the first ones we found. And then with space-based observatories, especially Kepler, we actually discovered that most of the planets are actually smaller. And they fall somewhere between the radius of Neptune and Earth. And you see again this pile up in a way at hotter uh, places or at shorter distances. Well, it's easier to find those, right? If you only have to find, look for 10 days and you find one transit, you have the planet. If the transit takes 100 days, you have to observe the star often enough during those 100 days to not miss that transit. And so being able to find planets further out with these techniques was mostly, for radio velocity, it's a little bit easier, even though you do have to have a frequency, but for transit, if you miss it, you've missed it. So finding planets uh, with a longer period in a transiting search, you really had to have a dedicated instrument, and that was Kepler. So Kepler launched and looked at 150,000 stars at the same time to not miss a transit. Yes, there were parts of uh, gaps in the data, but generally for three and a half years, Kepler looked at this 150,000 stars in the sky and gave us a new consensus of what kind of planets out there. And that completely changed our view. So not this hot Jupiters being the dominant species out there in terms of planets around other stars, but these planets in terms of a bit smaller than Neptune, so we call them mini Neptunes, or a bit larger than Earth, so we call them super Earth. Having said that, this is the region, Earth to Mars, where we actually absolutely not complete. These planets are incredibly hard to find. Thus, whether or not there's actually more planets down here is absolutely a possibility. We don't have the sensitivity yet to know that. But we do have the sensitivity to probe this area between Earth and Neptune. And mostly we have the sensitivity if you go back here to the host star's effective temperature, because a lot of the stars are cool stars. And so if you do a transiting search or even a ready velocity search, if the mass of the star or the size of the star is smaller, an Earth's size or an Earth's mass planet makes a bigger signal, a whooping signal, compared to if the same planet goes around a much bigger and much more massive star. So there's a bias in where we find the small stars and there's a bias of where we um, 
can find them currently. And so that bias is also an opportunity, but because it turns out that most of these small stars, these M stars that are most numerous in the galaxy, actually seem to have more rocky planets than we'd expect for a G star like our own sun or for even higher mass stars. And I'll get back to that in a minute. But so we have candidates all the way down to Mars. We've confirmed planets that are the size of Mars for the closest, smallest stars that is possible, but it's incredibly hard to do. But you see a big distribution. That's what we found. So what we found is that in the universe or in the small area around our star, the sun that we actually probed, you can actually find a large diversity of planets. That was the surprise. The planets can be incredibly hot because their period is very, very short, or the planets can be cool. And then if you add direct imaging to the mix, where you block out the star's light and you can find some planets very far away, especially when they're young and still bright in the infrared, then you start to fill in that region at the periods, uh, very long periods too. But so in between here, we are not very complete. And then also at the small planets, we're not very complete. And smaller with long orbits, kind of like a triangle here on the right, that's also completely incomplete. So what I'm showing you is still a bias due to our observation. But what you see is the diversity of planets out there. And that's really interesting because that started to rewrite all of uh, our formation models from the first time we found the hot Jupiters and now further on when we find more rocky planets around small stars. If you look at this a different way, and in my review you see this figure too, but uh, Sam Quinn from CFH just updated this for me so I have something new to show you. And so basically if you have the mass in Earth's mass on the x-axis and the radius in Earth's radius on the y-axis, Again, it is color coded. Well, here again, it is color coded by the incident flux. So, how much radiation the planet actually gets, how much radiation hits it. Then you see a really interesting density evolution here. And so, you see again a pile up here, you know, where the masses are pretty high and the radii are pretty high. And you see that there's a lot of radiation here. So, this again is the hot Jupiter era. And then down here, you start to see that we have small planets. And those small planets start to become comparable. These two violet things here without error bars are Earth and Venus, just for comparison. But it starts to become comparable to the rocky planets in our own solar system. And if I'm pushing the lines of mean density on top of this, and again, it's a little bit better explained in the review if you want more insight, but basically, if you say, if the planet were made out just of water, for this mass, it would have to have this radius. And then, of course, the more massive it gets, the equation of state of the material changes, all of this is taking into account here. And what you see is that there are different compositions. This is an Earth-like composition, the green line, and V is Venus, E is Earth, and so basically you see we already have some planets out there where we know both, not for only about a fourth of all the planets, we know both radius and mass because for the Kepler planets, they are so far away that it's incredibly hard to do the radial velocity method because there's just not enough photons for low mass planets. But for some of the planets, we have both the radius and the mass. And these are the ones I'm showing you here. So you see that there are actually a couple that fall on this line, of course, with arrow bars, that is this Earth-like density line. If you go up, 50% water is this kind of darkish uh, turquoise line, and then 100% water is this turquoise line here. So the 100% water is an important line because a planet is most likely not made out of 100% water. There will be some dirt, some rocks in it. But anything that's above, that sits above this line, needs a substantial amount of gas, like hydrogen, to explain why the radius is that big for this mass. And so, in a way, this is a very crude line between a super Earth, where you have a rocky planet with an outgassed atmosphere, and a mini Neptune, where you have a substantial gas layer 
in the atmosphere of the planet. And what's interesting here is trying to figure out if you don't have radius and mass, because it's hard to get the mass for these objects, and a lot of times they don't transcend, whether or not you can use the set that we have here to figure out if there are some limits. So you can say anything below 10 Earth's masses, for example, is rocky. If you're trying that, you actually see that that's not something you can do. Because if you go up the 10 Earth's mass line, you actually see that there's a lot of mini Neptunes also in the mix. So then you try to do the same thing, or you could go further and further down, and you have to go down to about two Earth rate, Earth's masses. And again, this is the only big problem you have. Let's say we believe the error bars and move this down. So you have to go below two Earth's masses to actually not hit anything that is not a rocky planet. But what about the radius? So if we're doing a transit search, that would be very useful. And so if you go to about two Earth's radii, below that, you don't find anything that's above this 100% borderline. And uh, what you say there is there's a lot of different models that actually argue that it's somewhere between 1.6 and two Earth's radii. And you see that the 1.6 is a more conservative limit uh, but somewhere between 1.6, two Earth radii is probably a good number to say, okay, if you found a transiting planet that's smaller than that, that means with everything you know, this is a rocky planet, as far as you know, most likely. And so that gives you a new tool. So even if you can't get the mass, it gives you an indication whether you found a rocky object or whether you found a gas planet. And so exoplanets in general is extremely driven by observation, what is great, because there's so many surprises we found along the way, planets we hadn't expected that existed in the first place, that our current rate of planets per spectral type is not the same as I said before, we're finding many more rocky planets around the smaller stars, which is great for us because there's way more small stars, and also for them to be just the right temperature, not too hot, not too cold, in this so-called habitable zone that I'm going to talk about, they have to be closer in because the star, the M star, is of course cooler, less luminous. And so then you don't need to look that long to actually find the transits. And this is exactly what we exploited for the test mission. So NASA's test mission was launched uh, to give us new insights in exoplanets. Not just that. What it does, but it's very different from Kepler. Kepler looked stared at one piece of the sky with 150,000 stars to give us the statistics of how many planets are out there in the first place. And in case you want to know, so one out of two stars has at least a planet. Again, I said you're not complete in the smaller planet category and this higher period category because we just, our instruments are just not good enough to find all of them. And one out of five stars has a planet that is within this region that we call the habitable zone, so not too hot, not too cold, this Goldilocks zone, as it's often portrayed in, in the press. And it's small enough that it could that it is a rock, as I said, by the definition of the two Earth radii. And so that is a huge insight that Kepler gave us. So one out of five stars has a potential habitable world. There's nothing to say after that if there's really life. We don't know how easy it is to make life. That's a completely different question. I'm happy to talk about it in the, in the discussion. But we know that there's a lot of potential habitable worlds out there. We know there's a lot of rocks at the right distance. From formation, it seems likely that they would have also gotten water. So then you can conclude there might be some liquid water on those places. And then, of course, there's the big open question, what does life need to get started? But at least we have a lot of places to look. And that's exactly what TESS exploits. Because TESS is not staring at one patch of the sky, it's actually scanning the whole sky. And the problem with that is that you're not looking long enough. So if a planet needs like 100 days to go around, chances that you're going to miss it because you're just scanning the sky are really high. So the way we design tests is that it actually looks for 27 days at each star. But of course, 
because it does, so the way it does it, it has four cameras like this. So uh, from the ecliptic equator to the ecliptic pole, it does that. And so by moving around like this every 27 days, it covers the whole sky. First year, southern sky, second year, northern sky. And when you see the geometry, my fingers are probably not the best thing, uh, you actually notice that because the sky is a sphere, how we map it, it's a sphere, you basically see that around the ecliptic pole, those viewing zones overlap. That was on purpose because that actually coincides with JWST viewing zones. So we wanted around the ecliptic pole to have a higher coverage. So around the ecliptic equator, we get about 27 days per star. But if we look farther up, we actually have a wider range. So the next uh, region over has like 54 days per star and so on and so forth until we cover about a year close to the ecliptic plane. And there's some altitudes for the observations so it's not completely a year, but it's about 300 days for that zone in the sky. And so we launched tests in April 2018. And here you see excited science teams member that our mission did not uh, blow up on launch. So <laughs> it was my first launch ever. So I was super excited to be there and also like seeing your mission go up and then giving data about two weeks later uh, to do calibration, of course, uh, was beyond thrilling. So it was really, really exciting. Even so, I do have to say we went with the Falcon 9. It was great because it came back, but I was expecting this rumbling <laughs> and the, 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 up, but NASA is being very careful about how far away you have to be. So nothing happens. And so it was more like a, and this thing went up and we're like, okay. Uh, but then we all celebrated because it didn't blow up. So it was all good. So it was a super exciting launch. And now our mission has actually been in space for a little bit more than uh, two years. So the primary mission was two years, one year for the Southern sky, one year for the Northern sky. 4 million stars is pretty much what we have for our tests. And we had 200,000 targets pre-selected to get a higher cadence, 30 second cadence data from it. All of that data is public. So if you want to work with the test data, just go ahead, Google tests or use mass uh, to find the, uh, the test data products. It's all there, it's all open, it's a community telescope. And currently we have about 2000 planetary candidates uh, a little bit more than 50 confirmed planets from tests. That was our goal for the mission. And so they come piling in, what's great. And um, also other things, so it's not just an exoplanet mission. It also found about a hundred supernovas per year. And you can do um, a meteorite search with it and solar system things. So it's, it's really interesting. If you're interested in data off the solar system or exoplanets that's freely available for anyone, that's uh, what the test mission can give you. And so what I looked into uh, with a colleague, uh, with a couple of colleagues in the test mission is to say, well, how many of those stars after this two years have we now observed long enough so we could find an Earth-like planet or a planet that gets the same irradiation as the Earth? And it turns out for more than 4,000 stars, we've actually observed long enough that we should have seen three transit in an orbit that gets the same irradiation as the Earth. Again, for small M stars, this is what the test leveraged, that our mission leveraged, was lots of the stars around us are M stars. So you actually don't have to look for a year to find an Earth-like planet because you just have to look for a month, so a bit less than a month, actually. And so about 4,000 stars have already enough observation time that we should be able to see an Earth-like planet. As I said before, we have about 50 confirmed planets because first we find those, they are, they are a test object of interest, and then there's a lot, a slew of observation ongoing from the ground trying to confirm our objects. And so we have nine known exoplanets host on that list, and what that means is that we know they already have an exoplanet from other methods. Uh, or one of them is actually from TESS, but you know that they now scan the region all the way out to an Earth analog orbit. So you can figure out, you know, is there also an Earth-like planet there and get some statistic of which systems don't host one, which systems host one, what the configurations of planets is in all these different cases. Again, 
we are only at about uh, 50 test objects of interest, a little bit more right now, but this is piling up uh, fast. And what's really interesting too for me, again, we'll talk about the Hubble zone in a minute, is that for 600 stars, a little bit more, we've actually observed them long enough that you're not just be able to find a planet in the habitable, not in the Earth's equivalent orbit, so it gets exactly the same irradiation, but actually throughout the whole zone of the habitable zone. So throughout this whole zone that's roughly bracketed by Venus and Mars in our own system, where it just uh, gets enough irradiation if the planet is Earth's mass and have similar outgassing that we do to have liquid water on the surface. We'll get back to it in a bit, but it's interesting that we have hundreds of stars already where the observation time has been long enough that we'd be able to probe this whole zone with tests. Lots of people working on it. And what I wanted to do with this paper is to actually give them a target list, a priority list of which stars are the most interesting if you interested in the habitable zone or rocky planets like Earth. These are the most interesting stars currently with tests because these are the stars where we have enough time. Of course, the next issue is signal to noise because there were some kind of background issues. And so this is the next paper that some of my colleagues are working on. But if you're interested, there is this filter graph portal. It's in the paper. Also, I'm happy to send you the email. If you wanna look at which stars specifically we have enough time off tests, with tests already to be able to find an Earth analog irradiated planet or actually probe the whole habitable zone. And I think it's exciting to actually probe this whole habitable zone because we don't have an understanding at all yet, what's perfectly fine because it's early day, of how the habitable zone population actually plays into this whole idea of habitability too. And so, let me get to this idea of the habitable zone. I've already talked about it a bit. So the concept of the habitable zone is pretty simple because it needs to be to be useful to observers and designing uh, our spacecrafts. So the habitable zone is really the zone around the star where you could have surface water. So you know the luminosity of your star and that gives you a certain distance to get enough irradiation for an Earth that it's not completely hot, so you evaporate all the ocean, think Venus, or not so cold that it completely freezes over. So that's really kind of the two distances of the habitable zone. And so Venus and Mars are pretty good analogs in our own system. Mars is a little bit dodgy because Mars was too small. So Mars, actually, if you shifted the Earth to Mars's orbit, you would increase, from all we know, the CO2 in our atmosphere so that it still would be warm on the surface of an Earth mass planet in Mars's orbit around our sun. And so this is basically how this zone is defined, but it's defined for remote detectable life. What that means is that by no means does it mean this is the only place around the star where there could be life. Absolutely not. It's just if there's life and we want to find it remotely, this is our best chance. Because in our own solar system, we can go to these icy moons, hopefully soon, and maybe even drill through the ice and have a look what subsurface, if there's some biota. But for exoplanets, we don't have that possibility. So the only thing we get is whatever is in the air of that planet. And then when light from the star hits it, when light and the uh, gases in the atmosphere of the planets interact, thus creating absorption lines, that's how I can read the atmosphere of a planet that far away. That's my only option. So something has to change the atmosphere. And nobody knows whether or not a huge ice layer would actually impede the possibility of even if life were there and it produced gases, those actually getting into the atmosphere, accumulating so that I can spot it remotely. So the habitable zone is only a concept for remote detectability of life Life could be outside of the habitable zone, absolutely. That's why we're looking at the icy moons in our solar system. But um, to find it remotely, we probably need surface water. That's our best bet. And so this is how we define the zone. And so how can you really do that? Well, you start with Earth. And so you know how much light comes in. 
you know how much light gets reflected, you know how much light gets absorbed. And so you build your model, an Earth atmosphere model, to reproduce that. And then you go and say, okay, now I simplify this in a way. So it's a 1D model that I'm working with, or most people are working with. You could do this in 2D and 3D as well. Um, the problem is if you do it in more dimensions, you need to know more about the planets, like the topography, the rotation rate, and so on and so forth. So you'd have to make some guesses of what that could be for another planet. But if you take our own planet and, for example, make, you know, 100 layers of the atmosphere and impede it with like the, the flux from our sun, then you can reproduce Earth pretty well. So in a 1D model, of course, you need the photochemistry, you need the input and output, so the climate photochemistry layer, you can actually reproduce the Earth uh, very well. You can also reproduce Mars very well. Venus is a different story because of the big cloud layer. But generally, that works pretty well. And so what you do is you use that, and then you change the flux of the star, for example, or the mass of the planet to figure out what planets with different characteristics could be like and under what conditions they could provide warm surface conditions. And so when you calculate where those limits are, and again, they're a little bit based on where Venus is and where Mars is in our solar system, because we know when there was no more liquid water on the surface of Mars, and we absolutely know when there was no more water on the surface of Venus, we don't know the number very well because it could have been a couple of billion years before, but basically these are our brackets. So Venus and Mars, roughly, are our brackets for this empirical habitable zone, that's what we call it. So what you see here is the effective stellar flux. Left is more of it, right is less of it, and then the different stellar temperature. And you see that this habitable zone changes with the effective temperature of the star, mostly due to Rayleigh scattering, because if more blue light hits the planet, more of it gets reflected into space. There's also a secondary effect about how CH4 and CO2 actually absorb in the atmosphere. But we have already about three dozen planets that are within these habitable sun limits. And some that you might have heard about are, for example, the Trappist planets. So Trappist D, E, F, and G are actually within uh, the habitable zone. So that's super exciting. Uh, you see that's a very cool star, so it's an M star, uh, but there's actually more than one planet. There are four Earth-sized planets within the habitable zone around this one specific M star. So it's exciting. I talked about this empirical limits based on Venus and on Mars. And if you've heard about uh, the habitable zone conversations, there's also something people call conservative limits that come from this 1D models. But what those models don't have, what we can't have, is a cloud feedback. We don't know what happens if you make the atmosphere more and more and more humid, so you push the planet closer and closer to the star, because of course the problem is we don't have a data set. We don't have a planet that shows us, oh, if that happens, then the clouds become more fluffy, or they move up, they move down, there's more cloud coverage, there's less cloud coverage. There are 3D models who are trying to address that, and they're getting very interesting results. They're not consistent yet, but they're exploring those parameters. But so the real habitable zone limits are probably somewhere between the empirical and the conservative limits. We know the conservative limits are too low or too conservative. We don't know if the empirical limits are too wide. So 3D models are roughly put the limits somewhere half between the 1D models of the conservative and the empirical models. It's probably too much detail, so now let me go and talk about this is actually for our planet, okay? This is for the Earth. This is based on Earth and on a composition like Earth. So that means nitrogen, CO2, and water. With CO2 and water being the dominant greenhouse gases, if you push a planet closer to its star, it becomes more and more water, water vapor dominated, water vapor being the dominant greenhouse gas. If you push it further and further away, the carbonate silicate cycle that maintains the CO2 concentration in our atmosphere will lead to a buildup of CO2 in the atmosphere to still warm the surface of the planet. So 
outside of the half of the sun is CO2 dominated, inner side closer to the star, water dominated. But again, we have about three dozen planets that we know already in that list. Now, if the planet were actually different, let's assume a high volcanism, how would the limits of this have in change? So with sustained volcanism, this is a paper that we wrote in 2017, um, let's say about 20% uh, hydrogen could be in your atmosphere, then you can push out this habitable zone limits where it's still nice and warm on the surface a little bit further out, roughly by about 25%. So that's interesting because that would be kind of an early Mars scenario. And a lot of people have argued that with additional greenhouse gases, you could do that. And so we should not be very conservative in our estimates, which of the planets could be in the habitable zone. But when you look at the details, the devil is in the details. Because for example, if you add methane as an additional greenhouse gas, as we were thinking about um, this for Mars, methane is one of the things people were arguing about, is then it depends on the color of your sun or the surface temperature of your host star. Because for F2 about K stars, the addition of methane actually extends the habitable zone outwards. But for M stars, where we found most of the rocky planets, that actually truncates your habitable zone. Because what it does is that if you have a red incident irradiation, it actually, with a lot of CH4, you start to warm the upper atmosphere at the cost of the lower atmosphere. So you actually start to freeze the planet over earlier. And there's a lot of interesting questions about whether or not there could be a biological feedback that would keep the methane levels in check in such planets. Again, all early times, uh, but it's interesting to think about the habitable zone, not just in terms of the Earth, but in the terms of it will depend not only on the irradiation from the star, on that profile, on the SED of the star, but also on the composition of the atmosphere of the planet. Think young Earth versus old Earth. And so there's this opportunity that I talked about, not if there's a lot of methane, but generally with M stars. And so M stars seem to have more of these rocky planets than uh, per star than other stars. And there's a bias in observations, of course, because that's where we can find the small planets because the star is not that big. So it's a great opportunity, especially because about 80% of all the stars are M stars. And one of the big concerns that came up early is that M stars are incredibly active, especially early in their history. And so the UV levels on the ground would be much higher than current Earth, what is absolutely true. But here again, it helps if you think in terms of time for our own planet too, because the Earth was not always the same. And once you go to the level where there's no more ozone layer, so about 3 billion years ago, what you find is that the level of harsh UV radiation on the ground on the Earth is pretty comparable to the UV radiation that makes it to the ground on these M stars with these huge flares. One question that's completely open is whether or not these huge flares could destroy your atmosphere uh, basically frequently. We don't know that. That's something that observations will be able to tell us. But even if it did destroy or blast off some of the atmosphere, there is, uh, we have a secondary outgassed atmosphere on, the, on our planet, and a planet will keep outgassing gases if you keep destroying them. So it's a very, very interesting question, but just to put in that a lot of times people say, ooh, M stars are really bad hosts and maybe there's no life, maybe they sterilize everything. Even if that were the case, imagine an ocean on an M star. If life developed in an ocean, as we think life developed in water here, where there's the small ponds or the bottom of the ocean theory of how it started, uh, water shelters you from UV radiation. So Maybe there's going to be no surface life, or maybe surface life is going to come later, but surface life also came later in our Earth, so it wasn't there as far as we know uh, early on. So maybe M star planets are not that different, and this opportunity, because there are so many of these small stars close to us, plus they seem to have more rocky planets, is a real opportunity for us. 
And so just because I talked about the habitual zone, a really interesting concept there is too that, of course, the habitual zone changes with time because the luminosity of the star changes with time. And so you could think about some adventures. You know, could there be evolved stars that actually have melted ice worlds? What signs of life would you expect if it existed? Would it be very similar? I talked before about this ice layer impeding our possibility to find the gases in the atmosphere remotely. But what about if the habitable zone, as it will move outwards with time, were to melt that ice layer and all of a sudden all these gases can get into the atmosphere? And for our own solar system, if you want to think about it that way, there will be a time in about 12, uh, well, in about 6 billion, 6 to 8 billion years, where uh, this habitable zone will actually be all the way out at the position of Jupiter and Saturn and could defreeze the icy moons there. So that is just absolutely an adventure, an idea outside the box, but I thought you might wanna uh, have some of those too. So in all of this, Earth is our key to find signs of life because it's the only planet with life that we know. And so is there a spectral fingerprint for a habitable world? Well, first we look at the Earth spectra and here I'm showing you a low resolution spectra about 70 in the infrared. And then we compare it to the other two rocky planets next door, Mars and Venus. And what you see is that all of them show CO2 features at around 50 microns, but only the Earth shows the ozone feature at 9.6, the water feature around 17, and then there's a secondary water feature here around 7, and then around 5.6 there's a methane feature. So the Earth looks very different than the other two rocky planets, and hopefully that's what we're going to be able to use to find life somewhere else. So at least it holds in our solar system. In our solar system, the one habitable planet looks different in its spectra than the other planets rocky planets. But I said our planet changed, right? So our planet's about 4.6 billion years old. So if we show that, and this is what you see here on the slides, on a 24-hour clock, what you see there is that the formation was about 4.6 billion years ago, origin of life probably 3.9 billion years, 3.5 is for sure, maybe 3.9. And then about 2.7 billion years ago, you start to have oxygen photosynthesis and oxygen starts to slowly build up in our atmosphere. And so what that really means is that for the first half of Earth's evolution, even though life exists, we have no telltale sign. And oxygen itself is not a telltale sign. It needs to be in combination with a reducing gas like methane to tell us that oxygen is produced in large amounts. And then we only have a biota to blame if the planet doesn't have an incredible amount of water or CO2 that you could split. So while there was life on the earth for let's say 3.5 billion years for sure, maybe 3.9 billion years, only when oxygen starts to become dominant in the atmosphere, while the reducing gas methane is still there, can we find a unique signature. So of course, the evolution of our planet, so the environment of our planet changed a lot during that time, and the biota changed a lot. And there's definitely a feedback, like the oxygen buildup is because of the biota on our planet. So we have something that we can basically see in the atmosphere of the planet that distinguishes modern Earths up here on top from um, the Earth when there was just the rise of oxygen. Well, the rise of oxygen was about 2.5 billion years ago. This is where we already had 10% oxygen in the atmosphere. And you see the ozone feature at 9.6 increasing with time. So this is time 3.9 billion years ago, about, uh, well, 800 million years ago and now. And I have a more detailed uh, model of this in my papers and all of the spectres are online. So if you wanna use it for some ideas of how to actually find these signatures with upcoming telescopes, please just use them and play with it yourself. But what I wanted to just say is that there are these differences, right? So there are these differences and you can see them. I showed you the infrared, but also in the near infrared from 3.9 billion years, 3.5 billion years ago. And then you have one to two billion years ago, 800 million years ago, and now. 
you see the change in the spectral fingerprint of the air. And this is transit spectrum. So this is how you would see a planet if it passes in front of the star and the light gets filtered through. And that's exactly what we're trying to find with the James Webb Space Telescope and in the longer run with this ELT, the Extremely Large Telescope, be it GMT, TMT. I think the ELT will be the first one that's large enough to give us an opportunity to do this in high resolution because for high resolution, you just need more photons. And so one of the things, if you want a uh, want to do this is like, please use, we have a catalog of spectra and I did them so everyone can actually get the best possible chance to find life out there if it exists. I put it out on the web, it's in the papers, it's in a Sonoda link, it's on Carl Sagan Institute, uh, .cornell.edu now slash data, I'll update the link. But basically, even if you go carlsaganinstitute.org, you'll find it, it automatically links you but we have those data sets of spectra and models for you if you want to work with them to make the best possible proposals for these upcoming telescopes to not miss signs of life on a planet if they're out there. And we use everything we can, everything we know about the star, about the planets in these models. So let me just show you a couple at the end of the lecture. So I think the spectral fingerprints it's actually quite interesting that so far the spectra of these different planets actually look very different. If we do more and more modeling, I am sure we'll find some that will look the same. And then the question will become which part of planets are actually unique in terms of spectra and which ones uh, you could not tell apart. So we're in the process of doing that. And so this is what I showed you the effect, the spectra and the change through geological time for an Earth if it were going uh, around our sun. So this is basically a model for our own Earth around the sun through time. And then we uh, approach this or we expanded this for what about if it's not our sun? What about if it's a different SED, if it's a cooler star, if it's a hotter star? So there's a grid out there in case uh, you want to use it. It's high resolution. It's between 0.4 and 20 microns. It's for transiting case, reflection case and emission case. So if you want to do infrared, near infrared, visible, reflected light from the planet or transit light, feel free to use it or tell other people who are looking for something like that. Because I talked to a lot of observers and that was something that they were missing. And as a theorist, I'm more than happy to oblige to give you the best tools I can to find these interesting signatures on um, planets now that we have the telescopes. Another one that's really interesting, of course, is Proxima b. Even the next star over has a planet at the right distance, uh, so in the habitable zone. It doesn't transit, so we don't know if it's a rock or not, but it gets about 65% Earth's irradiation. If you remember the habitable zone limits, because it's an M star, it's a red star, that means less of the light gets reflected due to Rayleigh because it's redder. That means 65% Earth's irradiation actually makes the planet nice and warm and comfy. So this is spectra for Proxima b for different models, you know, an eroded atmosphere of 0 0.5 bar, 0 0.1 bar, a one bar atmosphere. We have Archean atmospheres and modern Earth atmospheres and what you can see. So this comes from this paper led by one of my undergrad students, Safan. And um, hopefully that's something that we'll be able to find. This is reflected light spectra here. So this is something that we hope we'll be able to find in secondary eclipse, maybe with something uh, like the ELTs because they have enough of a angle of separation that you could see the planet. And there's TRAPPIST, and this is a model for one of the planets, TRAPPIST-1e. So it gets 66% of Earth's irradiation. Again, it's a red star, so it's nice and warm. And you see that different kinds of atmosphere again would look differently, but you see there are different features for ozone, for example, here. There's even a nitrous uh, NO2 feature, N2O feature. There's another ozone feature here, CO2. CO2 is actually one of the strongest features. So being able to figure out whether or not there's CO2 in an atmosphere is actually quite simple compared to the other things. Not simple at all, but compared to the other features, CO2 is easy to find. And so, all these spectra exist and there's a new paper coming out that actually shows that within about uh, with a small uh, JWST program that's led by 
uh, Stefan and Ryan McDonald's here at Cornell, you could actually get a constraint on CO2 and CH4 for TRAPPIST-1E. It's getting harder if you want to constrain ozone and N2O, but with about 80 to 100 chances, you get a good upper limit for those two as well. Modern Earth, Archean Earth, and in case you're interested in other planets in our solar system, we actually have also made those. So we have a spectral catalog for planets and moons in our solar system that you're more than welcome to use. Again, all online. Uh, this is the right website now. So carlsaganinstitute.cornell.edu slash data because you want a reference catalog. How do other planets and moons look like when you find an exoplanet? Because it'd be cool to find like another Venus. It would be nice to find another Jupiter. You know, we found some planets that could potentially be like Jupiter, but not that far out yet because it's hard to do that. So we have a reference catalog for 19 objects in our solar system in the visible, if you wanna play with that. And so one last adventure that I wanted to talk to you about is this evolution, right? I talked to you about, I showed you how the evolution of the habitable zone happens, but what about dead stars? And that is a pretty crazy idea, but we just found, that's Andrew Vandenberg's paper, with tests. You know, I was on the team, but Andrew found the first giant planet around a white dwarf. So if there's a giant planet around a white dwarf, there could be rocky planets around a white dwarf. And we haven't found one yet, but people are luckily now really looking. And so we wrote this paper because it gets so much better with small stars. Remember, I said the M stars are just such great. A, they are numerous, but they're also smaller. So an Earth-sized planet makes a much bigger signal for an M star than around a big star. But a white dwarf is the best you can get because a white dwarf is about the size of the Earth, so a little bit bigger. So an Earth-sized planet around a white dwarf has a whooping signal and would actually allow you to have robust detection of molecules. Now, whether or not there could be habitability around those white dwarf planets is completely open. What we did is we said, if such a planet were like the Earth, what would you expect to see? Because one of the big questions I had in this research was, well, even if there are signs of life, would there actually be some that I can pick up with a telescope? And it turns out there actually would be. And again, I'm not saying there can be life on a planet around an exploded star, but it is easy to probe the atmosphere if such planets exist. And wouldn't it be fascinating to see what we find? Because how did those planets get there? Are there cores, exposed cores of an original giant planet that spiraled in? Are there second generation objects? How could we tell the difference? So the discovery that uh, Andrew made uh, or published last year with the test data has given us the first white dwarf planet, a giant planet around uh, a white dwarf. So maybe there are small ones out there too. It should be easier for them to survive. But again, we've only found one planet so far. And I wanted to show you that this is my team. So my team's helping me doing all these different discoveries, my personal team, not the Carl Sagan Institute. And so these are the people who helped me do all the work. And as a last point, this is the paper we just finished, is with the amazing Gaia data, we looked out, and this is a completely different approach now. So we looking at planets that transit their stars. But if you reverse the viewpoint, who could have actually seen the Earth transit the sun? And that gives you a sliver, like a very small geometrical uh, region. And this is what you see here, this uh, dots of stars here. And this is an amazing animation by Cheki Faharti at the American Museum of Natural History. But basically there is a region. So within about 326 light years, 100 parsecs, there are about a thousand stars that could right now see the Earth as a transiting planet. And so I just wanted to leave you with this as a last idea. So which stars can see Earth as a transiting planet is another uh, few, I think, that's sometimes interesting to just ponder when you have too much time. Who could see us? And with that, this I just wanted to bring up my conclusions. So the diversity of these worlds is 
what's startling and what's interesting and what will teach us much more about how planets form, how their evolution history shapes them. And we have dozens of potentially habitable worlds, again, small enough at the right distance, this habitable zone boundaries. And JWST and the ELTs are our first chance to find such signs of life. Extremely difficult at the you know, at the limits of technical capability. And so I hope the spectral database that we put out for everyone to use will be a good tool for observers to refine the search, to refine the retrieval mechanisms, to actually help us know how long we have to observe to find something. And I think Earth is our key, but seen through time, not just right now. And ideas that some of them I touched on, some of them I didn't get to, but there's a super diverse biota on the earth. So it's not just us there, biota in extreme environments. How could you see that? Uh, young and evolved host stars, how do they change the picture? And what about signs of life in a very harsh UV environment like an M star, either hiding from sight or doing something like fly fluorescence with corals do if you actually shine UV light on here on the earth. And then I put, your idea here because I find that one of the most fun things for me in this research is actually get ideas from people who are outside my discipline or outside my institute, outside my university, because sometimes it's just like a great conversation of a coffee. And for example, the biofluorescence idea got started exactly that way. So I put your idea here. And with that, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Lisa. I'm going to bring up my camera so that you can see I'm clapping in the name of everybody else in the department. So multiply that by 38 or 39 or something like that. And we all look at this. That was an awesome talk. I, I really loved it. Um, can, do people have questions? Uh, it looks like there is one question I can see. Yeah, from Ryan. Uh, and Ryan, why don't you ask that live? Cool, thanks. Hi. Um, Hi, Lisa. Thanks for a wonderful talk. Um, Thank you. Uh, I'm wondering, so the possibility of biosignatures of, of planets around a white dwarf is really interesting, and not one, I think, as you as you pointed out, is pretty novel that most of us probably haven't considered. Um, and so I'm wondering, uh, the fact that you get this high contrast ratio because the stars are so small, but that also has the disadvantage of making them much less likely to transit, right? So what... Um, I'm just curious because I don't have a good sense of what the radius of the habitable zone would be. Like, what actually is the probability of catching one of those in the transit? And are there enough white dwarfs uh, in the neighborhood um, that even uh, one of them might be, even if they all had Earth like planets, that so one of them would be transiting so that we could do this spectroscopy? Yeah. Great questions. So it was a huge surprise that we actually found a giant planet around a white dwarf. Nobody was expecting it. Like Andrew probably was expecting it because it was his project, but he was hoping for it. But we really had no idea, right? Because uh, yes, there are three known planets that pulse us right now, but that was all that they found. So whether or not there could be planets around white dwarf was completely open. The great thing was that TESS just scans the whole sky. So without having a dedicated observing campaign, if you look at all the white dwarfs there in the test sample, then you now get this for free. And for free, I mean, actually, Andrew had to write a whole new pipeline because the test uh, uh, pipeline throws out those planets because they are much too big of a signal. Oh. And so, <laughs> you know, when something is like 70% of a transit signal, this throws it out because it's, a, it's an error. Uh, but so your question... Um, they're twofold. So A, we didn't think that there would be one. Um, the habitable sound for white dwarf is actually only a couple of hours. Okay. So you really, really close it. And it depends, right? Because the white dwarfs are really bright initially, very hot. But then mostly if you get to the 5,000, 6,000 Kelvin. And so the, the interesting thing is the transit is about 10 minutes. <laughs> so it's actually, it's starting to become like 10 to 5 minutes. It's starting to be like, you need a dedicated um, uh instruments like tests to do that. And your question about how many white dwarfs there are, that's actually also an excellent question. And the excellent question is like, so we knew how many white dwarfs there was and then Antogaia DR3. 
So Gaia DO3 has, uh, has actually identified a lot more white dwarfs than we thought existed. But if I have, I think I have the number right, I think it's definitely 100 to 300 within about, um, what was the number, within like about uh, 50 parsecs, 100 parsecs. It's in our paper. I completely blanking on it right now. But so because the habitable zone is so close, the probability of transit is actually not negligible. And it also, the radius of the star versus the radius of the planet also falls in. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, we have no clue how many planets to expect in the first place, because when Andrew found that planet, that giant planet was makes even less sense because, you know, if you think like some rocky pieces are still around, that might be easier to argue. Um, but when, uh, when Andrew found that giant planets, that's when the people who do formation started to get involved. And the argument was that it probably should be a planet that's far out initially and survives the explosion of the star and then uh, do interaction actually starts to migrate inwards. And so that is the best explanation they have so far. And the interesting thing for that would be that it comes late. So it takes time to migrate inwards and that would actually shelter it from the initial super hot period that would basically evaporate most of your water if you were a rocky planet. So in a way the timing seems to be working out well too with the formation models that we have so far, but nobody expected a planet to be there. And um, I wish I could tell you it was a 10%, you know, even, so if every planet had, if every white dwarf had a planet, then uh, the detection probability is actually quite high because in the habitable zone, because the habitable zone is so close and the size of the star to the size of the planet is also quite good. Cool. If that helps, sorry. They, they are closer white dwarfs. So Andrew is looking at those two. I'm like, closer? Closer would be better because we get more signal. And one last thing that I was super surprised by when we did this uh, work, because I'm a co-author on Andrew's paper, uh, you can actually not do radio velocity on white dwarfs because there are no lines. You know, I should have known that, but I didn't think about it. And we're like, oh, so we actually convert it from constraining the mass of these objects by radio velocity because it should be a whooping signal because it's a giant planet around a white dwarf and we couldn't. So they used Spitzer mm. because they used Spitzer to determine the mass. And so it was really, really interesting. I, you know, my astrophysics uh, started to come back <laughs> because I wasn't thinking about this. So it was interesting yeah. how to do this. Awesome, thank you. Um, Elizabeth, you can speak. Um, you want to ask your question? Yes, yeah, the expert. So Elizabeth will know way more about this. Uh, I'm going to ask you about biofluorescence, though, which okay. I'm not an expert in. <laughs> um, I was wondering whether detecting biofluorescence would require like a planet-wide plant life. And since coral was the example you had, if we did have coral all over the entire uh, planet orbiting, you know, a UV bright star, would that work? Would we be able to see that? Yeah, so thank you. Thanks for the question. Uh, it's really, really interesting. So this biofluorescent, actually we used this um, example of the corals because we had one of the CSI coffees and we're like, well, what does, uh, what does biota do if you hit it with UV? And there was somebody who does diving and said, if I go with my blue light UV lamp, everything shines, you know? And currently what's really interesting is they're finding more and more, even in the animal kingdom, things that biofluoresce. So it's really interesting, nobody knows why. So flying squirrels apparently biofluoresce pink. In case you ever see a flying squirrel and you have a UV oh. lamp, you can see it light up pink. So I'm learning a lot of things as I go. But for a planet, it's, it's a really good question. So for a planet, what would be involved? What would be involved is that you would have to have, absolutely, you would have to, the more coverage you have, the better the signals you would have. So the argument why that should actually work or could actually work, so we talked with a couple of biologists to do biofluorescence, is that uh, you would, or a, an organism would want the visible light as well, assuming that they do photosynthesis. So what they would do is they would actually be very close to the surface of whatever medium they're in. Let's assume it'd be an ocean. And then if the whole planet were covered with it, right, then half of the planet would light up, the half that's basically just facing the, uh, the star that, uh, that, that releases this UV radiation. And so it was just a very interesting idea. And we did it, I think, also in terms of trying to get out of this box 
of thinking a bit too conservatively about how to find life out there. But generally, uh, the biologists were actually the ones who had the least problem with our paper. It was very interesting. They were like, yeah, of course, you know, the efficiency of biofluorescence will go up if it's in the interest of the biota to do so. And you can actually make biofluorescence 99% efficient, apparently. So if you have a 99% efficient biofluorescence, you need much less surface to cover. Of course, if it's further down below the water, it's different. But then the biota, the biologists were saying, well, you might want to have the visible light. The visible light gets also uh, less and less the further down you are. So chances are this thing would be on top of the ocean. So uh, we made an estimate how much surface coverage you would need for the different efficiencies. And then we uh, applied it you know, to Proxima B. That would be our best chance, of course. <laughs> you, know, you have a red star, you have UV. Um, the signal is much, much stronger than uh, the signals of biota would be. So that's not to say it's great, but uh, it would be also a temporary signal would be interesting. And the other question is how long would it survive, right? Because if you have to integrate over your observations. And so there's all these caveats coming in. But um, again, talking to biologists, I didn't think that you could cover the whole planet with, uh, with, bio with biofluorescent algae, but apparently there is no reason why you couldn't. Yeah, well, I, I have a couple of questions, but I'll leave it for the virtual <laughs> two days. One last question uh, from David. David, are you still there? Yes, okay. Yes, I am. Um, we've had it presented previously, the idea of uh, phosphine gas as a biomarker, something that uh, apparently it's very hard to make, but for whatever reason, um, life seems to generate it. Um, how viable is that as a marker in planetary atmospheres? So uh, this is one of the highly debated recent results, especially because it goes with Venus. And so I'll give you the outline of this problem. So the problem is that phosphine can be involved by some bacteria and can be produced by some bacteria, but we find it on Jupiter, where it's definitely not from bacteria. So the argument is that you'd have to argue why there's why the phosphine that you find cannot be produced without biota. And uh, there's a paper by Jonathan Lunine, for example, here at Cornell, that showed that you could have phosphine actually coming out of volcanoes without any life at all. There's uh -huh. another paper that's quite interesting is that said um, that our models for Venus are just not very good. And if you actually use a good model for Venus, you could have this phosphines, especially from volcanism, but they actually wouldn't be at the cloud height. It actually would be higher. So because um, you know, volcanism would have gotten it there and then it could actually sustain itself for a while before it disappears. And we knew that Venus had volcanism a while ago. So they, they're having what's really, really interesting and very important about this discovery is that it actually revived the interest in Venus modeling. And it revived the interest of people who know geology really well and actually helping with uh, improving the models. So phosphine is mm -hmm. not in the community uh, seen as something that would be a unique biosignature. And so I, I kept stressing, you know, oxygen with reducing gas because mm -hmm. oxygen alone you can get by just splitting water or CO2. And if there's no reducing gas that, that reacts with it, oxygen and methane go to CO2 and water. So if you find oxygen with methane or ozone with methane, doesn't really matter, then you know something is producing oxygen right now in huge amounts. And then when the planet is not too hot or not completely suffocated with CO2, then you can't do that except for biota. So that's what we call a biosignature. CO2 itself could be life. Phosphine could be life. Methane could be life. Methane on Mars could be life, right? This whole debate. But it's unlikely because we have so many other geological explanations. And I'm going with Carl Sagan, you know, extraordinary right. results, extraordinary evidence. Yeah, hydrogen sulfide is another one that could occur um, any, either way, you know, it yeah. can feed life, but it could just be there. But yes, exactly. you're, I understand oxygen is probably a very good marker. Yeah. That, uh, it's very unusual that we have an oxygen atmosphere. And it's right. solely because there's life here. But there's lots of other things, you know, that would be interesting, but we haven't found anything that's uniquely biota, I would say. That's basically what we're trying to 
pin down. And for example, Sarah Seeger at MIT is having this huge process of finding, trying to, to identify all the different uh, gases that biota makes and trying to figure out if they could be accumulating in the atmosphere and trying to figure out if there are no other geological venues to do that. And I think this is where most things break down. There's so many geological venues to do something, unfortunately, or fortunately, whatever you want to see it, that unique signatures for life are very hard to come by. All right, maybe that you want to look for a combination of yeah. markers. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I think that's what we'll have to do. We'll have to understand the planet, basically. And so hopefully we'll have a wavelength range. No one gas will be able to tell us mm -hmm. about life on another planet, unfortunately. Oxygen and rocket fuel. Okay, combination in the atmosphere. Okay, folks, we've got to move on. Um, those of you who are interested in continuing, we can talk to Lisa for a few more minutes if she won't mind. Yeah, in our of course. virtual team, uh, mm -hmm. there's a link that everybody has. Lisa, it's here on the chat if you can see. Oh, perfect. Yeah. And we'll just move right there so that we can continue this. Thanks, everyone, for coming and see you next Friday, I guess. Bye. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Bye. And I will get out of I'm leaving this one. Okay, Let's I'll see. try this. It's confusing. I think, yeah, we can go. Oh, this is the colloquium meet. Okay.